So it's a real pleasure being here. Um, well, I don't have to tell you, I'm uh, pretty much motivated to make this reality. And I'm also pretty much aware of some of the roadblocks that, that are in our way, but I don't see anything that we cannot resolve. So let, let's talk about it. Um, you've heard this before. Actually, good thing that, Brian, our statistics are the same. 75% of chronic uh, of healthcare costs is in chronic disease. Um, the silver tsunami Brian mentioned, also 5% of the population accounts for 50% of the healthcare spent. 400 million people have diabetes, 400 million. About 400 million people have COPD. So these are large numbers, you know, 400 million is more than the population of the US. Now talking about the US, US spends 3.2 trillion dollars on healthcare. Just the waste in the system is more than the entire GDP of the UK. So it's one of the largest industry, yet we have so much to do. We have so much to do to care better for all these people with chronic disease, for our parents, for our grandparents, uh, for ourselves. So that's what we're going to talk about. But then you look at the other side. I'm a technology guy. I've been in technology for the last 30 years. I've also seen what good it can do to the world. Um, but something very fundamental is happening at this stage, and I've never seen this in these 30 years. So just as a backdrop, the power in our phone makes the phone probably the best healthcare device ever. You know, we don't see it as a healthcare device, but it is one as probably the best one. The transition just from 2G to 4G was 12K, a factor of 12,000. There will be 40 billion devices connected that we can talk to, get information, get context. But it's also a social phenomenon. So it's not just technology. You know, the fact that a billion people actually communicate on Facebook also tells us something about the social change that it enabled. And then closer to the healthcare industry, a genome sequence took nine months and about 100 million 10 years ago. Today it's under $1,000 24 hours. I bet you that in two years you spit into a device and in real time it spits out your DNA and it will be under $100. That will have huge impact. But what I'm trying to say here, there is a groundswell, there is a wave that we have to ride to create better care for everybody. And the way we looked at it is that today, you know, as Brian mentioned as well, the system is organized around acute care. And the way we reimburse care is very much around that acute care. We pay people for doctors and nurses for the procedures they do on patients. But if we talk about chronic disease, it's chronic. You know, it will be there the rest of your life. You know, my daughter, may better control her condition, but she knows that she has to live with it for the rest of her life. She knows that she will develop complications that she will try to avoid. She knows that it will have an impact on her daily life. Yet the healthcare system is not organized around it. So what we see is that forward-looking organizations, and I'm talking, you've seen the video of Rothbaut, but equally I can share the stories of people like Karolinska, um, Banner Health, Kaiser Permanente, um, a number of forward-looking healthcare providers are starting to look at things differently. They basically start looking at the people they take responsibility for, for their health. That's different than treating somebody with an acute situation. Taking responsibility means that, number one, you help people to live healthy because 50% of us don't have anything, but may develop something. But 50% of us have either a chronic disease or are at high risk of developing one. So we support people to live healthy. So we as Philips decided that we want to do that as well. We're a 124-year company that constantly has to reinvent itself. And we're at this point of, of real reinvention, where we say, okay, we got to take our our presence in the consumer industry and use that presence, that knowledge of people and how they use devices and how they live and how they play and turn that into something of a positive force. So we help people with eating. You know, we have uh, devices that help uh, people um, eat food that doesn't need to be 
um, uh, fried. So we have an uh, air fryer that allows you to eat fried food without all the negative connotation. We have an air purifier, which is really relevant for all these people with COPD or an asthma. Um, we have a whole range of services that are focused on prevention because we want to help people at risk. So we no want to just give a device for blood pressure or heartbeat. We want to give a coaching program that help people at risk of heart failure. We want to give a coaching pro program for people with weight problems because they're becoming at risk for diabetes. Then when people come to the hospital, we want to be able to create the right context and have all the information there so that if something happens, an acute situation, we can make the right diagnosis. And the right diagnosis means that we know a lot about that patient. We know the background, we know their issues, so that we can decide there and then what the best diagnosis should be, what the best treatment is. And then we want to make that treatment as least invasive as possible. So we're, inventing, uh, we're investing a lot in what we call image-guided uh, intervention, where, you know, through small catheters that we bring into the body without operating on a person, we can treat a cancer, we can open up a heart valve. And that gets you out of the hospital within two, three hours. But then you're still frail. So we want to monitor you at home and make sure that we can keep you monitored the way we monitor patients in the ICU. And then we want to give you the tools to manage that heart failure. We want to give you the tools to manage diabetes or recovery from cancer. So we believe we got to move close to the patient. We got to be where the patient is. So we developed an ultrasound on a tablet. Now with an ultrasound, for instance, if you have a heart problem, the doctor can come to you. They can take an ultrasound of your heart. Or if you're a pregnant woman with complications, the midwife, you know, 80% I just heard in Sweden are done by midwives. The midwives can be trained on the ultrasound, bring the ultrasound to your home. We have a, a blood test on a chip. So you do a blood test here and now. You can do it at home and it will give you immediately the result. You don't have to go to a lab, you don't have to wait a couple of days. We, um, we have a, a patch, so if you're discharged from the hospital, we give you the little patch that you wear and we can monitor you. I've been wearing the patch myself and actually the telehealth team remotely can monitor me 24-7. We have a fall detection device. It's a little pendant that elderly people wear that's also actually a dedicated phone. So if anything happens, they press the button and there will be always somebody to help them. But if they would fall and they cannot press that button, the device will know the person has fallen. Actually, it also tracks deterioration. So it will track whether you get up slowly or fast. It will see whether your gait has changed and it can tell you the risk of falling has increased and therefore we can send somebody, one of these health coaches, to help you. But it's also a hub, it's a digital hub, so we can connect a medication dispenser that automatically manage your medication. You know, this is a real big issue, because we're talking about people with 10, 15 medications, with slight dementia, how they're gonna deal with their medication. This device will help that organize, and will tell the caregiver that a person doesn't take their medication, so we can reach out again. So, prevention is really important, and prevention is not just having a, something that measures your stuff. It's really about monitoring in the context of who you are, but most importantly, most importantly is motivate. Because a lot of the chronic disease is health, uh, lifestyle related. So how you eat, how you sleep, whether you take alcohol, um, your activity. So a lot of this chronic disease can be either avoided or better managed by better motivating people. So motivation becomes really, really important. So just a device, just an app is not enough. And motivation can mean an e-coach, an algorithm that helps you, or it can be a life coach. And I think that combination of high tech and high touch is gonna make the big difference. You know, I'm a big proponent of health coaches, but health coaches have, be, have to be connected to the network, have to understand the details of the people they care about and have to be linked to the clinical team. So how do we bring these people together? And what you've seen in, uh, in the video is not just a diabetes app, it's not just the fact that we can connect a glucose meter 
or a heartbeat meter or activity tracker or a tool to help you deal with the carbs and manage your insulin because that's important. But I think it's way more important that it gives you an entry into a network. And it can be a professional network, can be a diabetes nurse, it can be an, intensiv an intensivist that monitors you proactively, or it can be an internist. But it also can, for instance, be a nutritionist. And my daughter lives in Amsterdam, but actually the nutritionist that really understands type 1 diabetes and young women may not be in Amsterdam. That person may be in Stockholm. So how can she connect to the best care around the world, the best knowledge and organize around her? by networking care. And it's strange that, n that healthcare still is a very, you know, physical, face-to-face -face industry. It's probably the last industry that hasn't com consumerized and that hasn't virtualized. And I think that's why we're here, because we all believe that technology can play a major role in getting to this better place. So, let's watch a video. <laughs> I like Sun City. It's a nice community. Our grandchildren come over here once a week. We have a couple of good friends that we like very much. In our age group, these are the things that are important. When we first met, he was just a friend. Nothing serious. He took me to a football game and gave me my first kiss. Don't go overboard now. <laughs> <laughs> Without communication, Ralph and I could have never survived the 64 years. We know that the top 5% of patients in any system um, use a lot of resources, time, money, people, you name it. Phillips and Banner are partnering to take care of the sickest of the ambulatory patients. We hope that we will be able to provide the support that they need to allow them to continue to live out their days at home. Ralph's not very good at taking his own blood pressure, so I take his blood pressure every morning. But he gets on the scale, weighs himself. 100.4.4. And then he goes to his little video. <laughs> I'll learn to say tablet one of these days. <laughs> At first, we were a little hesitant about all of this equipment. But as it was explained to us by people from Banner Eye Care and from Philips, we reached a point where we felt comfortable with it. Today, I would be lost without it. I'm just happy to be home with Ralph. To be able to talk to a doctor on a video, and we don't have to wait two or three days for a doctor appointment, it's fabulous. If I have an emergency, all I do is push a button. There's somebody at Banner Eye Care there for me immediately. This is the future. It's really an amazing model of care that doesn't exist anywhere else yet. When I have a team of people augmented by a lot of Philips technology, I can catch things earlier, treat things earlier, and intervene in a way that allows me to accomplish what I set out to do as a geriatrician and then ultimately to do some good in these patients' lives. I'm just thankful that we joined Banner Eye Care and that we have Philips equipment here. We're married 64 years. I can't say we'll have 64 more years. We're trying. <laughs> yeah, we're trying. Innovation and youth. Philips. So every time I watch this video, I think about what we're doing. I, I think we're giving people back dignity. We let them live at home. These people are the super utilizers that Brian talked about. They typically have four or five chronic diseases. They're on 15 medications. They have slight dementia. 
these are the people that go to the hospital, you know, five, six times a year that occupy a lot of the emergency care. Now, what we've seen in this pilot is not just making their lives better. We actually reduced the cost by 27%. And why? Because we avoided readmissions in the hospital. We avoided getting people into the emergency care. And actually, this was a high-touch, high-tech system because we also use health coaches with Banner, people going home, talking to people, but then sharing their observations with the care team. Now, here's a big change. It's not the technology. It's the fact that at Banner, they work as a care team with a geriatrician, with an intensivist, with a nurse, with a pharmacist, because medication is complex, with a behavioral analyst. So what's really the best way to motivate these people? With a nutritionist, how can we help them you know, make sure they have the, the right nutrition? And these care teams can now take care of thousands of thousands of patients at the same time. And guess what? These super utilizers, out of a thousand patients, only 10 need an intervention. And that can range from simple things like you gotta take your medication, or actually we see a deterioration which may indicate a heart attack, so we're sending help right now. Um, so avoiding these complex acute situations and make sure that you intervene early. So I want you to study this very carefully. Now, what I'm trying to say here is we're doing something similar with Karolinska. And with Karolinska, we took the same approach. We said we start with the patient. And we start with patients that are at risk of a stroke. And as you, we all know, a stroke can be deadly. So how can we help prevent a stroke? How can we see early indications of a stroke? And if a stroke happens, how can we make sure we know all about that patient so when we send an ambulance there, they know the right thing to do and they can help um, avoid further deterioration there and then. But then also, which hospital should we send them to? Because the person may have a rare complication that only can be treated you know, in one hospital in the Stockholm area. Then when they get into the hospital, how can we make sure they get the right priority and all the clinicians responsible for the care know exactly what to do and what this patient is about? And when we treat the patient and send them back home, how can we continue monitoring them? And what you see here is a care flow. And that care flow has been designed by, the, by patients, has been designed by emergency care people, has been designed by cardiologists. It has been co-created with every stakeholder. And I think that's the big difference, because most healthcare systems have been designed either by clinicians or by administrators, rarely by patients. And that's what we're doing today. We have patients co-create and drive what we're doing, and we organize around patients in a network manner, and we make sure that the right people with the right expertise at the right moment provide that care. And not an appointment three months from now, here and now, as and when needed. And that's a big difference. Now, similarly, we're expanding that into the clinical care. So what do we really know about the person with the heart failure? Or what do we know about the person with the cancer? And increasingly, we're using technology to start interpreting not just images. So we can see that a lesion has grown, but we can also see whether it's malignant or not. And you cannot see that on a picture just like that. You need to interpret the, the image, and you need to apply clinical algorithms that tell you that. You need to understand that if we do chemotherapy, will there be a high probability of success? So we enter genomics. We do pathology today under a microscope. This is like a 200-year technology, old technology. Now we're doing digital pathology. There's a great shortage of pathologists in the world, so we're increasingly looking at networking pathologists and get the be best expertise to where it's needed. So. How we're doing this is we believe you need a core platform, a data infrastructure that pulls in the data from medical records, from devices, from apps, from clinical applications, make sure that that data is interpreted the same way to normalize it, and then feed it into the different parts of the care system. So you need analytics because you need to analyze for this specific patients what is the probability of a deterioration. What's the probability of a fall? So how can we make sure we enroll this person in the right program, a type 1 diabetes program for a young woman? Um, 
a person who can self-manage but has high blood pressure, or a complex patient with four comorbidities that we need to proactively monitor like we do in uh, Banner. So you need a set of tools and capabilities for the patients to manage. You need a coordination uh, suite that helps the different caregivers, including friends and family. So in the type 1 diabetes app, I'm actually a caregiver for my daughter, so I can read out her data and I can communicate directly with her diabetes nurse. And at the back, of course, we need to integrate it with the clinical data because even the cardiologists, oncologists, neurologists want to have the full picture of that patient. So that's where we see the future. Digital technologies have a huge impact on our everyday life but we need to enable them in the new healthcare models. And new healthcare models are patient-centric, are outcome-focused, and yes, acute care, episodic care is still important. Emergency care is really important, but it's way more important now to deal with chronic disease. It's got to be networked. We have to have access to the best people around the globe. We have to start proactively monitoring people. As I said, with just a handful of people, you can monitor thousands and thousands of patients at home, built on the knowledge that we build in uh, ICU patient monitoring. And you need an information infrastructure. You need the data to flow. And today, still, it's hard to get data out of medical records. So we need politicians to help us expose data. We need data to flow. I also believe privacy has been solved. Security has been solved. We just need to apply it structurally to healthcare. You know, 20 years ago, my team in the US launched internet banking. Most of people said, you're crazy. Nobody's ever going to do their banking online. I get into the same discussions. You know, healthcare information is very sensitive. Nobody's ever going to put their healthcare data in the cloud. I think we're wrong because I believe in this room, probably 99.9% .9 of people are banking online, and we can apply similar security measures to your personal health data online. And lastly, and most importantly, nobody's going to do it on their own. You, you need the Karolinskas, you need forward-looking insurers that come with new reimbursement models, you need technology companies like ourselves, and you need young, innovative companies to collectively solve these extremely complex problems of health. But we can do it, we've seen the first results, and we know where the future is. Thank you. Thank you, John. Really, actually, you, you touched on two. Uh, first, I was thinking you, you went past the, a really interesting point there, where you actually described not only, it's not only about gadgets, it's also about addressing the cost of unhealth. If we don't do anything about it, it's going to be even worse. So yeah. I, I really appreciated that. But, and then, as well, you did actually address the, the uh, question about the integrity and security in the end, which I know a lot of people feel, because it's easy to say, you know, open all the data, expose it, measure everything, measure everyone, all the time. But, and, you know, but how do you feel the transition into, you know, that openness with data it needs to be? Are you, you did the banking uh, yep. analogy there? Or? Yeah, so, so let me give you our view. So first, I think you need to have a secure place where you can pull in your own data. So the data you generate yourself through apps and devices, but also I think you have the right to look at your own medical data. If yeah. somebody did an MRI, you want that MRI. And, and then I think it's up to the patient to decide whom to give permission. I know there are people that say, hey, you know, just take my data for research purposes. Actually, over 80% of the people are saying, hey, you can use my yeah. data as long as I know it's anonymized. Yeah. Then there are other people that say, you know, just put it out there. If I can help other people, I will do it. If it can help me, it will really be important. There are other people that say, I want to collect it all. And if something happens, I want to press that button and open up the gate so, you know, caregivers yeah. can look at my data. So I, I think we've got to look at a system where we can implement these different views on privacy and data. But yeah. at all times, it has to be secure. It has to be linked with you know, digital identities that we can manage. So that's another topic for politicians. Yeah, that's, yeah exactly. And that's the next talk as well. But before we let you go, do I have any, any comments or questions from uh, our panel? Of, uh yes, please. Uh, uh, my reflection is uh, how can we, for example, implement Dr. Watson in the uh, healthcare safety system? Because for me, as a patient, I think it's a safety issue. Yeah. And I think also, 
uh, that we need uh, health coaches is a sign that the, the system doesn't work. So I think it's the, it's the wrong way to go. So I, I think we see a lot of um, forward-looking healthcare systems also looking at large-scale analytics, basically looking at, uh, you know, there are many patients like me, and I have a similar profile. I, I would be very interested to learn about it. You know, I'm using two medications. To be honest, I'm not sure whether the right medication. My doctor is not sure either. Now, if we could compare me with, you know, thousands of people like me, I think we get a much better insight in what medication would work for me. And similarly, you know, a very good friend of mine has ap epilepsy, and it's, uh, you know, they call it in the U.S. a crapshoot. So they try medication after medication. Now, the more we know about the profile of that the friend of mine, and the better we can yeah. compare it with others, I think oh, the more okay. accurately we can find a medication that would work. So, but that means that we need to share that data, um, that that data needs to be uh, normalized and accessible. So if we say, hey, the data has to be within, within this hospital and it cannot be shared or it has to be only for this person, we we'll never make this big leap in, uh, in medicine that we're ready to do. Uh, therefore, I think the healthcare system needs Dr. Watson. It's well, I, I don't think they need or Dr. Watson like or something Dr. similar. <laughs> no, I understand that, but something like Dr. Watson. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I agree. You yeah. need the, the analytics on large populations to help better assess what the right uh, uh, care path is. Yes? Uh, I think one of the the things I, I liked about this talk was the fact that you, you touched on the co-creation and the, uh, the fact that we, we need to develop the healthcare rather than just talk about developing technology. Because, I mean, a lot of the things that you've been describing here is, are things that we've, we have been seeing for a few years, but the big issue is really how do we develop our healthcare system here in Sweden so that we can actually utilize this new technology. And I think that's the biggest change that we need to, to go through here. I, I totally agree. And it's, it's been uh, pretty eye-opening when we brought together CEO of a large hospital group, um, an insurer, patients, general practitioners, and uh, specialists. And we co-designed how we should manage the, the, the care path. And you need all of these, because you need the, uh, the payer, because you have to reimburse in a different way. You need the patients, because it's all about them. But for instance, just a specialist won't work, because you also have a general practitioner. And people will get different roles in the new system. So you got to get together and, and, and yeah. craft that together. And, and, and it was, you know, we've done a couple of those, and they've been uh, a real experience for everybody. Uh, and everybody walked out of there like, okay, I've never done something like that. And it's actually so simple. You bring people together and work together. I, I know we could probably spend another hour on this and with questions and comments as well. But you're here as well for the conference. I'm here. So please, you know, talk to Jeroen. Uh, you're all here as well, so talk to them and talk to us. But we need to move on. Jeroen Tass, thank you very much for Thanks so much for being here. Enjoy being in Sweden always.